Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Friday morning, um, end of the week. The weekend is soon. Um, my name is Maddie, and I'm going to be your host today. And I'm delighted to have this big audience here, um, or this very uh, high quality audience as well, um, to discuss this very important topic of licensing, um, which is so important to also guarantee the resilience of our industry. So um, there, there's a real mix in the audience today. We have some uh, producers, we have uh, academics, commissioners, funders, and content creators. So I'm sure that this will lead to a very um, insightful discussion. And before we kick off, I just want to tell you a little bit about the background and history of what uh, these, show these show and tell events are. So Digital Catapult has been running for the past few years, a program of support for the Audience of the Future Award winners. And one of the goals of this program was really about facilitating, ooh, excuse me, having some issues with my slides today, sorry. Um, <laughs> facilitating um, shared workings, uh, shared working and learning from each other. But this year we decided, well, actually it was last year in March during our second lockdown that we decided to try out a, this new format called the show and tell. And this was to include a wider audience of award winners from both Audience of the Future and from Creative Clusters. And the show and tell events were formatted around topics um, related to the immersive industry, such as inclusive design, digital humans, immersive audio. And this seventh one is about archiving. Uh, and the events are structured in such a way that they create a forum for sharing learnings, um, sorry about that, for sharing learnings and challenging assumptions. And there are many times com community curated. However, um, on this occasion, we are actually, um, they're actually part of a research project that we're conducting. So I'm gonna let Aki tell us a bit more about that. Um, so um, who's in, in terms of who are your hosts today, my name is Maddie. I'm an innovation partner for the immersive and creative programs at Digital Catapult. Then we have Aki, who's going to introduce himself a bit more later on. Um, but I'm going to just have him say hello today. Hello. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and then we have Alice, who's our intern. Alice, can you just introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alice. I'm an intern at Digital Catapult in both the immersive team and also the artificial intelligence team. And I've been helping with the research and just also helping facilitate this, this meeting. Great. And then from the VNA, we have Joanna and Kate, um, who will be giving us a presentation. And uh, I'll just let them introduce themselves now, though. Hi, everyone. I'm Joanna Norman. I'm Director of Research Library and Archives at the VNA. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kate Bailey. I'm a senior curator in theatre and performance at the VNA. Great, thanks, thanks, guys. Um, so, in terms of the agenda, we have a very straightforward agenda today. If my slides will let me. Sorry, everyone. Uh... <laughs> I did practice beforehand. I don't know why it's not working. So we have a very straightforward agenda and um, we will hear these two fantastic 10 minute presentations. Um, and, uh, um, and then we're going to go into a QA and a and a, and a discussion that as Aki men will mention later on, we'll feed into our research. So we're almost there uh, to jump into the uh, presentations. However, first, I just want to remind you of a few housekeeping points. So this event is, record is going to be recorded and maybe published onto the Audience of the Future Live site. So please refrain from sharing any sensitive information. Um, don't forget to introduce yourself. Um, and if you don't, one of us will remind you. Uh, use the raise hand function on Zoom at the bottom right under reactions, and one of us will call on you. Um, if possible, we would love for you to turn on your camera and mic 
um, when you speak and when you participate <clears throat> in the session, but we understand that this is not possible for everyone. So don't let that stop you from contributing. And if you prefer, you can use a chat function. Also, if you want to see the captions, check on live transcript at the bottom and then click on view subtitles. And if you have any issues at all during the event, please send myself or Alice a private message. So I'm now going to stop sharing these slides, which have frustrated me a bit. And now I'm going to hand over to Aki um, to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. So I hope everybody is seeing what I'm seeing. Uh, so yes, I'm going to be giving you an update on the research that we are conducting at the Catapult on behalf of UKRI as part of the Audience of the Future program. And it's really uh, trying to create an overview of the immersive content life cycle. So, and obviously uh, it's in our interest as the Catapult and, and within the Audience of the Future program uh, in general to support the longevity of uh, content that is created uh, with immersive technologies and, and then archiving and restoring it uh, at some point is, is part of that. And uh, so there's a couple of contexts obviously to this research. I'll cover them in a minute, but basically what we are asking the main questions in the research are around what is the current state of immersive content or archival and preservation and restoration? And are there like reference points to earlier forms of, for instance, installation and media art and practices over there that uh, immersive content uh, archival could draw from? And are there any sort of blind spots? So it's really trying to identify the key challenges in this space and then start discussion and, and this, uh, session is for, for me, who is leading the research very much like uh, a, a testing ground for some of the findings, observations, and hypotheses that we have at the moment uh, carrying out the research. And the other context here, uh, more specifically, is the uh, number of pieces of research that we have already um, completed as part of Audience the Future. So we have studied both uh, creators' notions of audiences. We've studied uh, what type of business models are there in this creative immersive landscape and commissioned a piece of market research. And now uh, as the final piece, we are looking at the whole sort of life cycle in order to produce an overview of uh, for people committed and interested in this space to understand that what are the distribution options and what uh, could take a piece of content actually up to the point where it is archived and, and possibly even restored for future audiences. And so uh, from the Catapult point of view, obviously we are not an institution that is uh, has a remit of archiving things or even collecting things, but uh, we have been involved in accelerating content creation, for instance, through the Creative XR program that has run uh, through three cohorts. And as part of the Audience of the Future last year, we produced Immersive Arcade, which was a showcase, a retrospective of 12 pieces of high quality VR content produced in the UK. And while we did this, uh, obviously because it was a retrospective, out of the 12 pieces, I think 11 had been exhibited somewhere before, uh, we actually sort of almost accidentally ended up facing some of the challenges that had to do with restoring work and it's sort of a telling of this space um, that even um, work that was no more than five years old, which in the sort of broader archival context is, is like nothing, uh, that presented problems in getting it to our chosen platform museum about the realities and, and showcasing it sort of true to the original identity and authenticity of the work. But in any case, that's just to underline also the fact that our interest is in, in guaranteeing the longevity of uh, high quality pieces of content in this space, because that would contribute to the whole sort of sustainability of the immersive content creation market and ecosystem. So I, I just, I'm using this term creative immersive content or immersive creative content. And I just want to use uh, just very shortly to underline what I'm talking about, where, where the focus here is. So, 
So first of all, there's the question of immersive technology. Uh, a more technical term might be spatial computing, uh, but anyhow, so it, I want to make the distinction between something that more traditionally might be considered immersive, such as computer games or interactive applications that still reside at the confines of 2D screens. Here we are talking about technologies that enable understanding the ways around us and then creating that immersive space that somehow dynamically uh, responds to audiences and their interactions. And this is often the sort of, if audiences are asked, we have found that what is immersive, what comes true is this idea that it's somehow a dynamic interactive space that responds to what I'm doing. So there is this very strong aspect of being real time, three dimensional and involving embodied interaction in a more embodied sense than, uh, you know, tapping our keyboards and, and mouses and so on and so forth. So that's the immersive part. Then the creative part comes from uh, the focus into the context of arts, culture and, culture and entertainment. And this obviously has been pretty, pretty much the focus of audience the future. And so when we are now considering the challenges and the requirements for archiving something, to give a couple of examples for what from what the audience of the future demonstrators have produced. So ranging from mobile AR applications like the big fix up here by the fictioneers to uh, the lost origin location-based uh, mixed reality uh, entertainment piece for by Factory 42. They both have similar uh, technical challenges in terms of archiving and restoration and, and preservation, but also very different because uh, Lost Origin had physical sets, so it has many material consequences. And this is something that our friends from the DNA will, will be uh, talking about later. But then there is the whole space of, for instance, mobile augmented reality, which really is the type of augmented reality that the general audience out there sort of perceives what aug augmented reality is. And because it's such a recent thing, there's really, at least thus far, we haven't really found any initiatives that would like try to look into how would you restore something that is current today in mobile AR, where operating systems, smartphone models, uh, all kinds of things develop year by year. And unless uh, an application like the Big Fix Up is continuously maintained and updated, it won't work. Uh, for more than a, almost a year uh, or, or something like that. So that's already sort of identity on one important blind spot that, that we are seeing is the mobile space uh, where there's not much uh, uh, emu software emulation, archiving, preservation going on. So more broadly, so first of all, uh, this is something that uh, so sort of considering what does it take to archive immersive content and restore it is, is not sort of an ahistorical. There, there's precedents and very many things to draw from media art and installation art. And even there, this whole notion of archiving in a traditional sense has been put to test because these works which operate with multiple technologies and are quite fluid in, in, in themselves, uh, they have sort of questioned many of the more traditional uh, notions of archiving, but also documentation, preservation, and restoration. So, uh, but there are reference points, as I've already alluded to. So I think the most important ones are the practices in so-called time-based media preservation. Uh, but also there are reference points because of immersive content tends to be interactive. So computer and video games and what's been done there in terms of emulators, for instance, is important. And then when we look at the sort of uh, net art and online art, digital art in that sense, there's also practices there that, that we can draw from. But the fact is that, especially with location-based uh, entertainment, location-based installations in the immersive space, there often are also other contingencies in a technical sense to different software services, APIs, online resources. And if those go away, or get deprecated, uh, then that presents a problem for any future uh, restorer of this work. But I want to pick out a couple of things here. So what you see in the, in the pictures here is, for instance, what Guggenheim has done in the Conserving Computer-Based Art in Initiative. And, and then for anybody who is interested, 
or trying to practice preserving VR works. The, 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 the recent report from Tate is really recommended reading and it goes to the nuts and bolts of the challenges of uh, the tech, more technical side of things. Uh, another interesting case study that I think is, is entertaining to, to watch is this uh, talk about uh, how the pioneering VR work from Char Davis in the 90s has been continuously updated and restored. And I want to draw, I'll uh, pick out one specific thing here that is, has been very important and made this possible has been that there has been constant dialogue with the artist of how about the key decisions of how to preserve something like this. And also, but it's also an interesting case study in that it highlights the whole question of that, okay, what is the identity of the original work? And what does it take to, what does, it, what does authenticity mean? So for instance, in this case, as you see from the screenshot here, uh, they have not tried to preserve the original hardware, the, the very sort of cumbersome headset from, from the late nineties, but they've taken the path of updating the software to the latest headsets. And there's also a vest, uh, haptic vest involved, and that has also been updated. But there's a, this is quite an, an unique project in the sense that it's quite exceptional that actually the same people have been involved in the project from almost for 20 years. And that is something that I, I feel is quite a, quite a big ask if we think about uh, these kinds of projects that, you know, that sort of tacit knowledge would, would go with the whole life cycle of a, a piece like that. But that's something to keep in mind. And, all, and, and for me, having uh, conducted this research, what has really come true uh, is that there's no archiving without documentation. But then that whole notion of what is a document comes into question. And what, is, what I have found useful is this, this um, division of, in, into three different functions and phases of documentation that Annette Decker, who has studied installation art, for instance, and documentation practices there. So, documentation as a process. So something that tries to document the creative decisions and the how the work came to be. So number two, docu documentation as presentation. So basically creating uh, materials that communicate what the work is, including marketing and promotional materials. And, and then third is the documentation that serves any kind of recreation in the future. And I'll return to these questions once we get to the discussion later on, but my, take here is that we can ask that, okay, if we look at the creative immersive creators of today, are they doing, uh, to what, what extent are they doing one and three? They are certainly doing two in our experience to try to promote and, and showcase their work and, and you know, try to reach people. But in our experience, number one can be very ad hoc, unsystematic, inconsistent. And number three is a luxury that many creative immersive content creators don't have. So the questions are that, okay, how would we as an industry facilitate number three and how would it be organized in the first place? So I'll return to these questions later on. I'm almost at the end. Uh, there's a couple of things uh, to take mm. note. Uh, another research question has to do with previous so documentation approaches and models. So here you see a couple of examples. There are a few out there that have tried to capture this notion of that if there's a fluid piece of installation art with multiple technologies involved, multiple skill sets involved in the production team, how would you document what the work is really about to re retain its authenticity for future research, but also restoration. And something that I would still want to do uh, within this research project is to test these, these, these approaches and how do they, for instance, are they able to capture the relevant things about a contemporary piece, let's say a mobile AR piece. And I would, would be very interested to hear if there are people in the room who have experience of using these models and how do they see that they stand the test of time when we talk about immersive content. So I want to stop there, but summarize a few things. So really, if there's how, what, and who having to do with the challenges of, of this area, the how really comes down to documentation, but not just any documentation. Obviously, the more high quality, comprehensive, and fitting the purpose the documentation is, the better 
uh, it serves any purpose. It serves also like a franchising purpose if, if, if the work is still in its life cycle, trying to make revenue from further exhibitions and showcasing and so forth. Then the what? Certainly, there's different approaches here. You can either stockpile hardware or you can try to migrate to new hardware. You, you most likely nowadays, with when these projects mostly are created with real-time 3D game engines, you would want to store those projects. Obviously, you want to keep the artist involved, uh, but all this, of course, requires quite a lot of work. And even more work comes from the fact that we are seeing that it's not just this one-off thing. You need to continuously maintain certain uh, technical aspects for to have any chance of these uh, pieces of work to keep, you know, be able to restore them in the future. And therefore, regarding the question of who, certainly we need uh, the tradition, the, the 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 more traditional skill sets of what does it mean to archive, what is what is information science, all that, and what is preservation and so on and so forth. But really the new thing that is even more crucial here is the hardware and software engineering knowledge. And traditionally, obviously this has not been part of uh, the archiving institutions of the world. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you at this point, happy to take questions after uh, our second uh, talk. Uh, so I'll stop staring now and I'll pass it okay. over to Joanne and Kate. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am going to share my screen uh, and pick up um, with a, a kind of perspective from the BNA on some of those points um, that, uh, that you have raised in terms of our own um, experience. This is, um, this is very much uh, some, uh, some case studies. Um, it's uh, similar challenges to those that, um, that you have already mentioned. And so we'll just talk uh, in, um, to those specific examples. Um, I can't see anyone, so I hope that you can um, see my screen uh, and I will uh, just kick off. So um, very briefly, uh, just to set this in context, um, why is this relevant to us uh, at the VNA? So we are uh, our strapline is uh, for the VNA is the world's leading museum of art, design, uh, and performance. It is a very broad um, remit that we have. You can see some examples of um, some of the types of objects that we uh, we hold within the museum's collection. We're, we are a museum that was created in the 1850s with a very um, specific remit that was not just focused on collecting uh, examples of historical art and design, but was very much connected to the creative industries. These examples were intended to serve, um, to help designers in training to improve the quality and therefore the competitiveness uh, of British design in industry. So if you think about all of those kind of manufacturing industries, um, that's the kind of uh, market that the, the museum was very much created to support. And as well as collections, education was a fundamental part of that. It had a tra design training school um, that was essentially embedded within the VNA uh, and in, in fact is now uh, is what has become the Royal College of Art. So as I say, we have very, very wide ranging um, collections. Uh, they cover uh, not comprehensively, um, but they cover about the last um, 5,000 years in all types of, uh, of material, ranging from the very physical uh, to the more ephemeral. Um, and it's really important to say that contemporary practice uh, and collecting has always been a, a key part of our mission. So alongside um, keeping up our, our collecting of examples of, I don't know, 18th, 19th, 20th century fashion uh, or furniture or ceramics, we have absolutely always sought to keep up with contemporary design and to represent that um, within the collections. That, of course, presents a huge challenge, uh, as, as Aki has outlined, uh, from the point of view of how we can possibly keep up with the increasing prevalence of digital practice um, and the hybrid nature of much uh, art design and performance um, as it is uh, practiced today. Um, and then one of the key challenges here is that, of course, museum systems, uh, the systems that we use to 
uh, to manage the process of bringing in acquisitions uh, into the museum, um, to record their status, where they are, their conservation state, um, the knowledge that we hold about them, and then uh, the systems that underpin the public face uh, of how people can access our collections uh, online. All of those are designed for analog objects. They're designed for um, objects where you can take a photograph, you can upload that photograph, it doesn't move, it doesn't change, um, and uh, it is a very easy static um, object uh, to, uh, to record and support in that way. The second challenge which is associated with that is that we have different systems um, that support different kinds of material and this is common across the sector um, and it is one of the main challenges when we're looking at how you can how you can connect different types of material that relate to the same production or the same maker the same designer um, so library archive and museum items tend to use different kinds of um, systems because uh, their requirements are different and in most cases, those systems are not interoperable. That's both within individual institutions and it is uh, across the sector. There are certain commonalities between different institutions uh, and there are some examples um, of uh, cross-institutional uh, platforms, um, but they're not universal uh, and, and that's a challenge. Um, and then, uh, so for example, if you look up, if you want to find objects uh, online that are in uh, different parts of the museum's collection, then these are just three of the places that you might find them and none of those uh, speak to each other. And then the last point, and this is one that um, Kate, my colleague, will, will pick up when I pass over to her, is that uh, we, as, as many of our many other cultural um, organisations, are both a collector and a creator of content. So we, we are faced with the challenge of how we collect these kinds of um, uh, digital uh, objects, hybrid experiences, immersive experiences, um, as, as Aki has outlined, but we're also creating those kind of experiences ourselves. Um, and so that presents challenges about what we do with those um, once uh, something has come to the end of its life, such as an, an exhibition. Um, I mentioned collecting born digital objects because this has been um, a subject of, uh, of research at the VNA. Um, over the last um, few years. And I think this uh, screenshot from our Explore the Collections um, online database uh, gives you a very clear um, snapshot of, uh, of what the challenge is. Because if you look up uh, this particular GIF um, from the WeChat app, you will see that uh, there's no image um, and this is really not a very useful um, record. And that's precisely because there isn't the, um, the system to, to, support, uh, to support that in the, the way I've just outlined. But there are other challenges um, as well. Um, there is uh, <clears throat> the fact that uh, there are IP issues, um, licensing issues, there are multiple actors who are involved uh, in the creation of some of these kinds of um, complex digital uh, or immersive um, uh, products, for want of a better word. Um, there are different kinds of software and hardware, as Aki has, uh, has indicated. So there's a variety of different challenges that make it very difficult for us to, um, to communicate the value um, of these kinds of objects as part of, uh, of a collection. And um, I want to, uh, to flag here um, uh, the project that has been uh, looking at this most recently, which is led by um, my colleagues, uh, Natalie Kane, uh, Gabby Aragoni, who I think is on the call and will be able to speak to this, uh, I'm sure, in more detail during the discussion, um, with Stephen McConaughey from the BFI and Joel McKim from Birkbeck, as well as, as, well as um, other colleagues. They um, held a workshop last week, um, which uh, presented the report that I've, I've linked to here, um, which I'd really encourage um, anyone who's interested to read, because it's, uh, it's a very... Um, it's a really comprehensive um, kind of state of the sector in many ways, that, but very much from the perspective of collecting institutions. And just to pull out some of the points that, that they raise uh, in, their, um, in their report, both challenges and, and recommendations are um, how embedded some of these, these objects are in multiple infrastructures, how reliant they are on networks, on external resources, as Aki has said, uh, data, servers, different kinds of hardware, 
Um, they are sometimes community generated. They don't necessarily always remain um, in the form that their creator um, intended. They're, they're often adapted, uh, modified um, by others. Um, and so they, they really force us to rethink what the concept of an object uh, is. Uh, I think going back to Aki's point about documentation um, and about uh, redefining um, uh, concepts of archiving, I think we're also redefining concepts um, of what, what objects are and really needing um, different kinds of relationships between cultural organizations and industry. So um, really needing to be involved in those conversations from the beginning so that, that the preservation um, and the collecting within the kind of organization that, um, that, that, that we're from, um, can that those conversations can start from the beginning uh, of the creation of a work, which is a challenge um, in and itself because that that represents a shift in how practice tends to work. Skills, um, I would absolutely echo what what Aki has said that we, in order to um, to really uh, curate and conserve and then communicate um, born digital and hybrid uh, objects or experiences. Um, we need different kinds of skills and we need a much closer integration um, between uh, forms of curatorial practice, which probably need to, to be different um, from, from the forms that, that exist for other kinds of collections. Um, we need the software and the hardware uh, skills to be totally embedded um, with those forms of, of curatorship. So as I say, I'd, I'd really um, encourage people to read that. Um, and then very briefly, just before I pass over um, to my colleague Kate, I also, uh, in addition to, to the challenge of, um, of digital uh, outputs and uh, objects and, and experiences, um, we have for many, many decades also been uh, tackling the challenge of how to archive uh, forms of live performance. Um, and this has, uh, I think, become um, even more of a priority uh, in recent years um, through our acquisition of the Glastonbury archive. Um, because then you are, we're also, of course, dealing with a, a spatial um, dimension uh, and a time-based um, dimension of, uh, of a festival. Um, so uh, this is something that um, through AHRC funding, um, and I should have said that the, the previous project is also funded through the AHRC's uh, Towards National Collection um, programme. Um, so in partnership with the AHRC, we have been looking at different ways that uh, you, we can create uh, entrances into um, these kinds of uh, live archives. Um, so do have a look at those if you're interested. The challenge, um, the challenges in many ways um, are the same. This is a, a, another one that we, we have produced, which is an interactive map um, that then links to, uh, to visual, to sonic um, and uh, um, memories from the, the Glastonbury Festival and some of our archival content. The challenge um, is the same. The challenge is, is around the IP, the challenge is around the, um, uh, the liveness of those, um, those types of objects, uh, which it's very difficult at the moment to, uh, to communicate um, in a meaningful way. So I'm going to pass over to, um, to Kate, who's going to speak uh, about a couple of examples of immersive experiences as they relate to exhibitions. Thank you, Jo. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to a couple of um, examples of where we as um, curators in the v &A are creating and curating immersive content. Um, so as Joe says, as a curator in theatre and performance, these um, the capture of the ephemeral, the capture of the performance and how we do that is something that we're, we're constantly kind of thinking about, whether that's the acquisition of an object which has from a you know, set model to, to, to video archive, but also to the way that we bring those performance objects to, to life and augment those within a visitor experience. So I'm just going to talk um, about Alice, which is a, a show which just finished at the V&A. And um, as curator of this show, I think it's a really interesting one um, in terms of presenting uh, immersive experiences from the outset. So the concept for the show was um, to kind of create uh, uh, an impossible adventure through um, Alice's adventures, Alice's adventures in Wonderland. So really thinking about the um, uh, the collections broadly. So we worked across from sort of um, prints and drawings through to fashion and photography, and then 
how to augment those in a visitor experience. So the digital layer was integral. And from the very beginning, we wanted to create our own immersive experiences. So drawing from the chapters in the book. So the, the opportunity within the show to kind of create a 4D immersive experience, looking at the books, which is such a great portal to that, and then thinking about how to augment our collections. Um, moving on to the next slide. Thanks, Joe. Sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's... Is it frozen? Yeah, it's freezing. But... So the, um, the, show, the slide that I was going to show you is one of the examples of, um, of an immersive experience within the exhibition, um, which uh, was created with the theatre design team. So as Joe said, you know, we're um, documenting and capturing creative practice and, practice and also working with those uh, contemporary practitioners. So this um, was a Pool of Tears exhibit that uh, this is the digital render of it rather than the exhibition experience itself, although it did look incredibly similar. So it was created with um, spatial audio um, with Gareth Fry, sound designer, Luke Hall's video designer, Tom, Paul, Tom Piper, set designer. So here we're creating something from scratch to create that immersive experience, which obviously once the exhibition um, has, has now left the building, um, the experience is no, no longer there and we have lots of fragmented assets. Moving on to the next slide, um, but also within the Alice exhibition, uh, we were able to um, explore and curate the first piece of um, the VR for the VNA from scratch. Um, and obviously, the, 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 the books really do lend themselves to that. So that opportunity of the VR headset being the looking glass for the 21st century. Um, so um, as uh, curator of the exhibition, I was able to partner with HTC um, and uh, work with technology um, for the for the it was a Vive Arts for the Cosmos headset to try and create a piece of um, VR content for the exhibition itself, which would also be available um, um, outside of the exhibition um, on a VR headset. So it was a steep, steep learning curve. Um, obviously, HTC had, uh, you know, we were doing um, sensor based VR, so it was interactive. Um, as, as well as it as it needing to kind of work within the sort of physical constraints of the exhibition. So just a little bit about what it actually ended up being. Um, so one of the things obviously that immersive technology allows you to do is to do things that you can't do in a physical space. And so for Alice in Wonderland, that's brilliant. So you could kind of create these moments where you offer a visitor um, some, uh, agency to do something that they can't do physically. With Alice, it's obviously growing and shrinking. I think this is a particularly interesting example in terms of archiving because, you know, we began with what we wanted it to deliver from a narrative perspective. We looked at um, these illustrations by Christiana Williams, which were created actually in a sort of, uh, with a Victorian, almost like a theatre technique to kind of give this collage. And then we built those in a VR space and allowed you to be Alice in this space and play Flamingo Croquet. I mean, why not? Um, but actually the... Um, the, the, the VR content also kind of created this hybrid experience so that it was integrated within the sort of um, uh, the whole exhibition experience itself within this dynamic landscape of staging Alice from the physical to the virtual. Then moving on, the next slide should show us hopefully some of the process of the creation because I um, uh, listening. Oh, actually, I'll just show you the video of what, what the VR actually did. In Wonderland, Hopefully. nothing is as it seems. Use your senses Great. to complete curious challenges. Race against the clock to capture the white rabbit's missing glove. Explore fantastical landscapes. Solve the caterpillar's mind-bending riddles. Defeat the Queen of Hearts in a curious game of croquet.
reward your curiosity. Discover your wonderland. That was curious, Alice, and I think um, one of the things that it um, uh, challenges it presented um, was, uh, you know, the the process that we went through to to create that from the sort of two D um, through to the um, interaction with with the technology itself. Um, so the, um, the, the 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 two D assets in that documentation they exist. There's obviously the interface with the, the sort of hardware, um, and I and I think actually one of the learning curves as well is that sort of interface between the the software and the hardware and the visitor experience. Um, but you know we we have now got this. Um, uh, content which will tour with the exhibition and is available from the ViaArts art platform uh, internationally and across many different headsets. Um, but it was the first time that we've done something within an exhibition context like this, and also thinking about the sort of relationship, this hybrid experience of the VR within the sort of scenographic landscape of the exhibition itself. The other challenge to flag with from the performance collections that I'm going to talk to is this idea of, um, you know, archiving immersive theatre. So we um, have a, a collection of the um, National Video Archive of Performing Arts, the NVAP collection, and so we have been capturing performance for 30 years within, within the museum's collections and um, always looking to kind of move that on. We currently work with um, live camera edits of performances and capture the um, performance as an object for the collection. But we're looking at uh, various uh, different challenges now, obviously. So from um, capturing immersive theatre itself, whether it's Punch Drunk or Secret Cinema, but also thinking about different ways of doing that. We did record um, Bowie's Lazarus with a 360 camera. So just thinking about the capturing of immersive theatre and also something that I've been um, looking at and the challenges it presents is the kind of capture of the sort of set model and the set design because obviously that's usually a sort of 4D process so you might be capturing the physical model but you need the projection design or the spatial audio so just thinking about those challenges within the collections themselves um, across the physical to the to the digital um, and then just the last project to reference um, is something which was really experimental and we were able to do as part of London Design Festival in uh, 2021, which was to present Sonzai at the v &A. So it was a piece created by a, a photographer, Roland Lane, um, with a motion capture of a designer, sorry, of a dancer. So there was a choreographed design performance that we could bring into the context of our paintings galleries. So it was working with uh, Microsoft's HoloLens um, to, to really create this fascinating kind of hybrid experience of a performer working within the environment of the museum. So thinking about sort of metaverse of the museum to, to um, augment the sort of exhibition experience. But the capture of this hybrid is something which would be incredibly complicated because um, uh, you have those assets that were um, created, which could actually be experienced um, anywhere, but then the opportunity to kind of work within the sort of, um, dynamics of the space and that um, the digital space, I think, within the museum context, the space between the object and the, the visitor is something that's um, going to kind of, you know, become more of a kind of question, question for us, whether that's through augmented reality, the mobile um, AR that you were talking about, or whether that's sonic experiences. So I think these are all very interesting challenges for the museum and the museum's interpretation and museums collecting and archiving going forward. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, um, Joanna, Kate and Aki. Those were absolutely fantastic presentations and really interesting projects that you outlined there. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to just, just one one thing that I wanted to say is um, we are able to stay a little bit past uh, 11. So if some people, you know, if the discussion is lively and we feel like we want to stay, um, we can uh, end the event a little bit, you know, later past 11. But let's see how it goes. Um, 
So I'd like to actually um, go back to Aki's presentation um, because Aki, you um, outlined two very interesting questions for the audience actually for us to start thinking about. And I realize we might not have the answers now, but we may have questions uh, on those questions or you know initial thoughts. So um, Aki, would you please um, remind us what those questions are? And um, we can see, you know, if anyone has any thoughts on them, please jump in. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's multiple, but I think for, for the content creators in the room, I guess uh, I, I collect my, my question. One question was slightly provocative in the sense that uh, I was basically saying that the documentation during uh, a production is quite, can be quite ad hoc and inconsistent and so on. But that's also based on my experience having worked in the games industry and software development projects. But anyhow, so I, I, I'm just interested also to hear if there's any content creators who have been in a position that they have been able to think about documenting the work in a way that it would be restaged or even uh, archived in the future. So that's more from the content creator's point of view. And then maybe for more from the research and uh, from the for the people who work in the archiving space is I mentioned a few of those models like the media art notation system, the variable media questionnaire. And so if there are people in the room who have in the past worked with these models and, and used them to document a piece of work, uh, it would be interesting to hear about their experiences and how they uh, do they still are they still valid for uh, documenting creative immersive work. So there's there's a couple, couple questions for a couple different uh, audience members. Um, so Anna, I I know that you um, have been maybe on both sides of creating content, but also uh, potentially you know making some steps around archiving or initial steps. So um, it would be great to hear your thoughts on this, and also please introduce yourself. Of course. Uh, well, first, thank you so much for these presentations. They were really extremely interesting and very inspiring. Uh, my name is Anna Brzezinska. I'm currently um, the immersive curator at Tribeca Film Festival, but I spent past three years of, of my professional life working with a company called Kaleidoscope. We've been an immersive production studio, and we've been working with a number of uh, partners and institutions and companies and creators uh, we've been also involved in um, the creation of the Immersive Arcade by Digital Catapult at the Museum of Other Realities. So um, it is true that, that I had a chance to, to, to look at these questions from, from different angles and different points of view. And I think that everything that Aki mentioned in his presentation um, is extremely important for the future of the entire digital art ecosystem. And, and I see I see a couple of things. I think I think there's one thing. Um, one thing is everything that we're aware of in terms of technological questions, issues related with resources. So the fact that there's a ma massive interoperability problem. Um, we have a variety of, of 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 types of content, of new um, genres that still uh, appear, and different types of technologies being used. Um, the, the fact that we cannot um, play, use, or, or keep the same type of content on different platforms. Um, this is obviously one problem. The, the fact that there's uh, very little resources or funds allocated to not only uh, preserving or conservating the content, but distributing the content, right? I mean, there are public funds, especially in Europe, in the United Kingdom, and in a couple of other countries. Uh, to, to creating content, but there aren't really um, public opportunities for studios or for companies to, to actually make this content accessible for a longer period of time. And there are really no platforms that wouldn't be private owned where we can actually do that. And this is a problem that is well known. And this is just one side of the, um, of the coin. And then another thing is I'm thinking about you know, also everything we're currently discussing in the context of, of blockchain and, and, and information that could be stored on the blockchain. And I think that we're also looking at a certain cultural shift because when we're asking about 
how do we actually um, preserve content? Where do we store it? Who's going to archive this content? It also is a question about gatekeepers because he who holds the keys to content and decisions about which content we have to prioritize as cultural heritage is actually creating history. So it's also a political question. And, um, and I think that creators who are um, trying to build this new culture, a culture of spatial art, interactive art, digital art, they want this content to be available for everyone, everywhere, at home, in their immediate um, surroundings and environment without any further obstacles. So I think that we're going to probably have to also think about maybe changing the model of who actually is to be, you know, the, the, the great historian of, of digital culture. Uh, and we're only, these are only early days that we're, um, that we're currently um, discussing. So I think there's a, a number of issues and thank you Aki for, for starting that conversation because it's extremely important from many different points of view. Wow, um, some really big questions there um, that I think are considerations that we have to really um, think about as we're continuing this conversation. I think particularly like the political question I find really interesting. I know that during Immersive Arcade, for example, um, there was a sort of um, way in which the content was selected. So we, you know, um, in terms of um, using different voices and asking different voices, what what the content should be that is part of that. But I think it's just the beginning of a conversation. Um, so I'm curious to know if any, uh, any people in the audience have any uh, responses or any additional thoughts, um, specifically maybe from the content creator side, and then we can move to sort of the uh, researcher side. I see that Rhoda um, made a comment in the chat, perhaps she'd like to expand on that. Yeah, I, I can touch on that. Uh... First, if I may, that because that highlights an interesting point here that uh, traditionally um, archiving, because these more, more traditional pieces of arts are more more like objects, as as we've discussed today. And I think it's interesting how uh, Rhoda's um, anecdote tell there tells that actually a repetition and and reimagining a piece of work and rebuilding it actually might be in the inherent nature of of these pieces of art and and they and that's kind of direct in direct tension of what we are sort of accustomed to and also that highlights the fact that it, there's been multiple suggestions in this space in the research space especially that it might be like a score or a notation or a choreography an orchestration that is the more valid reference point for documentation rather than what we we traditionally think because uh you know you can perform a musical score with different instruments and different performance but we still relate it to back to that score that has a name and an author and so on and so forth so i just wanted to highlight that based on Rhoda's comment thanks for that Rhoda actually may I ask you sorry Kerwin then I'll go to you I see you had your hands up um but Rhoda, may I ask you to introduce yourself and maybe, you know, if you want to respond to that or, or tell us a bit more about this, um, you know, your, your piece of content. Okay, um, so my name's Rhoda Ellis. Um, I'm a PhD student. I'm doing sculpture and virtual reality. Um, the piece I made, um, the idea was that uh, you would go into a gallery, so you would push open a door and um, the door had a, one of these little HTC pucks on it and you'd push open the door um, so you could see the door in the headset and you could feel this, the, and so the, the, the gallery space was mapped out in, um, in the virtual space and then when you went in there was a, um, a female sculpture uh, with her arm outstretched inviting you to touch her hand. You could touch any part of her, she was there in the physical and in the virtual, I put the um, a, a digital model over the top of the physical model and I made it through photogrammetry. And then um, I was asked to exhibit it in, um, in uh, um, 
an exhibition, well, it was a conference uh, for computer human interaction. Um, but when I sent the specifications over, um, the people that were making the room for me got it slightly wrong. So it was slightly out. So I had to rebuild the room completely. Um, and that meant, and I also had to update the software. So one of the things was because I made it in Unreal in 2017, and then when I came to do it in 2019, there were differences in the software. And it was like, do I make the decision to keep it in the version of Unreal that I was using, or do I change it and put it in the version of Unreal that's currently available? So when I did it in 2017, I was running it as a preview um, because that's the only way I, I was, I'm not a games designer, I'm a sculptor. So I was learning how to use Unreal. Um, and so it wasn't an executable file. It was just running it in the preview and it worked for the purposes of the exhibition, but I wanted it to be more professional for the exhibit for the for the one in Glasgow and so I um the big conference so I tried to make it an executable file um but because of so I tried to upgrade the software but maybe that was a mistake but it was one of those questions that I was considering at the time do I give what I made originally or do I just completely rebuild rebuild it mm. and every time since I've had to uh, had to think like that um I also did another archive. I got commissioned to do a piece um, that was a media, uh, it was um, a piece by David Hall. Um, and I was asked to recreate it in virtual reality as an experiment on here is a, um, a digital artwork that we only have like uh, his specifications about and the film clip it clips, but the equipment that it's played on is um, starting to go, starting to fall apart. So what is the benefit of doing it in virtual reality and rebuilding in virtual reality? Mm. Um, wow. So that was, and that's, so that was a piece, it was like a virtual David Hall. So it was a piece by an artwork, uh, by an artist who is now deceased and, and re, remaking it as well. And that was interesting going through those, some of the same questions I'm hearing you discuss today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rhoda, for sharing that. It's really interesting and sort of, yeah, touches on what Kate and Joanna were speaking about as well. Um, I, um, I'm i wondering, uh, Kerwin, actually, I saw that you had your hand up before, so um, I'd love to know what your question is. Um, it's probably less than, less of a question. Oh, sorry, I should introduce myself. My name is Kerwin. I'm the immersive lab technician at Digital Catapult. I help to run the lab, facilitate demos and such. Um, and it's probably less of a question and more for just an opinion. Um, just touching on one of Aki's questions about documentation regarding um, archiving content. I, I'm, I'm pretty, a pretty firm believer of um, getting in early and education. So one thing that I'll say is that while I was at university, I did a course on TV media and one something that they don't focus on is well at least in in the course that i studied was documentation and there wasn't a large or even much of a focus on thinking about okay how do you recreate this piece of content that you 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 have for future um systems or for for people in the future to view um and i feel as if that a lot of, well maybe not a lot this is probably a bit too broad to say but content creators have that wider vision that yes they would like people to view their content in the future but then they don't have they're not then thinking about what the processes are to then get that piece of content to be viewable in the future um and i i, I believe that if we want we want to be able to archive a lot of this content or to recreate a lot of this content for future audiences. We need to get in early and educate early content creators to start documenting their work in a particular way so that um, we can then recreate that content in the future. Um, and also to touch on Rhoda's comment about, um, you know, she mentioned that, you know, she was working on the particular version of Unreal and then there were, you know, those updates to that is, is, is very, very um, true. We're, I'm working on a little project at DC currently 
where we're using Unity to develop a, a, a little project. And we're using a current version of Unity. And there, if we were to update, it would break a lot of the codes that we currently have. And we'd have to recreate a lot of the stuff that we're doing. So it's it's a it's a very tough um, situation to be in. And, and But it's definitely one thinking about how um, how do we focus and get people to actually think about documenting their works for future generations to then recreate that content. And thank you very much for all the presentations. It was very lovely and very insightful. Thank you so much, Kerwin. Um, I was going to see, yeah, that, that was um, really, really interesting to hear. And I, I think you're right in terms of like, we need to somehow give more support to creators to think about this. But the thing is, yeah, in the beginning of development, you know, as kind of, I think Joanne and Kate mentioned, it's not in the practice currently. So, but we need to think about, I think, how we can um, make this part of the practice or, you know, support creators in some way. So, um, Simon, I'd actually love to hear your comments. I, you know, I saw that you were kind of writing something in the chat, but I'd love to hear your your thoughts. And I also know that you were you were kind of been thinking about this a lot as you're writing a paper about it. So, yes, please introduce yourself and tell us. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for an interesting discussion. Um, so my background's in games industry for twenty odd years. So um, content creation as part of games, and also working as a board member of Yuki for six years as well, thinking about how we archive and um, store, you know, digital content, games or otherwise, has been something I've thought about for a long time. Um, now we're running Co-op Innovations, we're building Curators, which is a platform for storytelling and also for capturing stories and content as well. Um, so that whether that's cultural, heritage, arts, all these kind of different things. So we are thinking about ways to technically do this, but of course, as I mentioned in the chat, the legal and the, and the business challenges are a, a big part of the problem as well. Um, so I think touching on what Aki and Anna had mentioned, you know, building these things into, sorry, Kerwin as well, you know, building the thought of capturing into the creation is a really interesting challenge. When we used to work for Sony producing games for them for many years, producing an archive of a rebuildable version of the software was kind of a contractual thing you had to do, but only to a certain degree, like you didn't need to have everything captured and all perfectly documented, it just had to be reasonably done. Um, but of course, that's locked away in a vault somewhere. And we worked on games where we'd be given a 10 year old game, update this and make it run. And you'd have to go through and you know, uh, effectively disassemble uh, and figure out these file formats and to rebuild it and all that kind of stuff, which requires quite a lot of technical skill and know how of how to do that. And normally someone who was around 20 years ago who did it at the time and had the software and everything else. So there's lots of very interesting technical archiving sort of skills, I guess, this is how we refer to it in this conversation. Um, I think as we move forward with open standards becoming more of a thing like OpenXR and everything else, the sort of emulation and backwards compatibility thing will become easier. Um, but I think ultimately the, the solution is going to be some form of emulation uh, and cloud uh, rendering based ways of, of doing this, I think will be the, the technical solution behind it. But I don't really know how we solve the, the business challenges because ultimately there's IP ownership, there's, you know, Oculus paid for 10% of it to be produced, HTC paid for 10%, who was the original rights owner, oh, it was based on this artist's work, and there was some music licensed in and blah, blah, blah. Um, personally, I don't think it's going to be the blockchain that solves that, but th there'll be some solution that does solve it and contracts that solve it, but planning for that in advance when most content creators are trying to keep the lights on and keep things moving forward, archiving it for 10, 20 years, 100 years time isn't their prime uh, concern at the time they're creating it when it could be captured very easily. Um, so yeah, not really a solution there, but we are thinking about ways that we can provide tools for anyone to capture these types of experiences and share them on our platform. So we're, we're trying to do a little bit towards that. Wow. Um, thank you so much for highlighting all of those issues um, in a really sort of clear way. Um, I'm going to hand over to Joanna now because I see you have your hand raised. I, I just I just wanted to respond to, to Simon because um, because I think, you know, from the from the collecting perspective, I think we absolutely appreciate the, the challenges that, that, you know, creators have and the fact that this is really, you know, it's not your priority. <laughs> and, and I think the um, I think one of the challenges is, you know, is we might not know we know what we want to do as a, as a kind of commissioning organization when we're creating the kind of thing that Kate spoke about for the Alice exhibition. What we don't know is, is what we want to 
at the at the outset, we wouldn't necessarily know what we want to bring into the collection and try and um, preserve for the long term. So, you know, the whole idea of trying to embed the, to to start that uh, that conversation comes up immediately against the challenge, the very real challenges you've outlined. But then also the fact that actually we might not be in a position to kind of commit to to that long term um, approach as well. And absolutely that, you know, the legal, the, the different um, owners of the, the rights and the complexity of managing that, it's a, just it's on such a different scale from what even the more complex um, objects that, that we've dealt with before. So we just wanted to say it's really it's really great to be in a conversation um, about this, but, but, but very, very, um, yeah, very much understand it. <laughs> Yes, and one thing that I just wanted to mention is last week we had a show and tell about licensing because that is part of the conversation as well as part of Aki's report about, you know, the whole life cycle of immersive content. So um, we did discuss some really interesting um, in, you know, some really interesting, I guess, discussion points around um, what what it means, um, like what are the what are the challenges specifically around licensing immersive content. So, if you, you know, I can send over around the link if you'd like to take a look at that one as well. Actually, your colleague Emma was there. Um, Simon. Um, so um, actually, Aki, if you don't mind, I just would like to ask one last question, um, which is about sort of what you brought up around the researching side of things. Um, do you mind um, just repeating it real quick? Well, I, I think we are starting to sort of lose most people to other meetings in the room, but I, I just want yes, to say that if there, yeah. if there are researchers in the room, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, uh, contact me uh, uh, offline afterwards uh, about your experiences uh, or if you have anything to share and contribute. I will be still sort of working on the research for the next couple of weeks before sort of starting to uh, close things. So that's that's really my my final message. Thanks. Thank you, Aki, for that final message. Yes, um, well, I wanted to thank everyone for staying a bit longer and, you know, contributing to the discussion. It's been really fascinating. Um, if you'd like, Simon has posted his email in the chat as well, if you'd like to get in touch with him, but also if you would like any specific introductions um, to people you've met here, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to introduce you. Um, and I'm also to Aki as well um, in terms of, you know, the researching side of things. So thank you, everyone. Have an amazing weekend. And I will see you at the next one. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.